In the early 18th century, New York City, then a colony of England, was one of the most important trading posts in all of North America, with slavery being one of its most important commodities. In 1712, roughly two dozen slaves banded together in rebellion against this inhuman state of affairs. They gathered weapons, set fire to an orchard, and hid in the shadows. When men came to tend to the fire, the slaves attacked, killing at least nine slave owners and injuring several more. While they had hoped to inspire a slave revolt throughout the city, in the end, the rioting slaves were hunted down and brutally murdered in ways far too unpleasant to relate here. In response, harsher laws were enacted to control the slave population, leading to more repression and human misery and starting America down a long and dark path of racial violence. Two and a half centuries later, despite the United States declaring their independence by stating unequivocally that all men are created equal, and then later outlawing slavery, the country was still torn apart by segregation and racial inequality, even in the West, where hundreds of thousands of black Americans migrated after World War II in hopes of finding safe haven. By the mid-1960s, race riots were becoming all too common, and after a questionable traffic stop went horribly wrong, the neighborhood of Watts in Los Angeles exploded in a four-day frenzy of violence that shook the nation to its core. While Watts was certainly the most impactful, racially charged riots continued into the early 70s, and such urban unrest became an endemic part of American life during the Civil Rights era. This became the backdrop for a science fiction film, the fourth in a series known for its social commentary that aimed to fully explore this phenomenon and recontextualize it in a clear way, to help put an end to the cycle of violence once and for all. It has been 18 years since the so-called Apenauts, Cornelius and Zira, appeared on the scene, claiming to be from a distant future where humans have become animals and apes have become the dominant species on Earth. Though it was thought that their infant child had been killed along with them during their deadly escape, we've just learned that the child lives on in the form of Caesar, the leader of the band of roving apes now wreaking havoc in our streets. Stay in your homes, lock your doors, and stay tuned for updates from local authorities, who are telling this station they hope to have the situation resolved within the hour. I repeat, lock your doors and remain in your homes. This will all be over soon. Before we go any further, if you could please hit that like button, you'll help me fight back against the lousy human bastards keeping my people down. If you really do like this video, please subscribe as well. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. When producer Arthur P. Jacobs and writer Paul Dane were working on how best to end 1971's Escape from the Planet of the Apes, they knew they wanted to leave the door open for a sequel, having been burned before by the apocalyptic conclusion to the previous film, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Thus, they left the baby chimpanzee of Cornelius and Zira alive in the end, hidden away in a traveling circus. After Escape's financial and critical success, the studio predictably demanded another sequel. So Jacobs and Dane began with the assumption that this baby, grown up, would be the central character and that the film would complete the narrative circle introduced by Cornelius and Zira's traveling backwards in time. Dane was keen to show the story of apes rebelling against their human masters, the loose outline of which had already been suggested both by Pierre Boulle's original novel and by Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Well, they, they became alert to the uh, concept of slavery. Hmm, and as their numbers grew to... Uh slavery's antidote. Despite being British, Dane leaned heavily on current American anxieties, even going so far as to model the climax of the script on the Watts riots. This immediately caused tension with the studio, which was excited by Dane and Jacobs' decision to take the series in a more action-oriented direction, but was eager to maintain the family-friendly audience cultivated by three successive G-rated pictures. Despite the studio's concerns about violence, though, Jacobs moved ahead with Dane's script and hired as director J. Lee Thompson, who had been previously considered for the original Planet of the Apes, and who had achieved a good reputation following The Guns of Navarone and Cape Fear. With a minuscule budget of $1.7 million, work began on Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. 
Roddy McDowell, who portrayed Cornelius in two of the three previous films, was brought back to play his character's own son, Caesar. McDowell does an amazing job behaving similarly enough to Cornelius to be a believable son, but also charting a very different course, one in which his ape character becomes embittered and ultimately radicalized against all of humanity. Reprising his role as the good-hearted circus owner Armando, whose death is largely responsible for Caesar's radicalization, is Ricardo Montalcon. I mean, Ricardo Montalban. The only other good human is Malcolm McDonald, the sympathetic governor's aide who helps Caesar and tries to pull him back from the brink of madness in the end. It was obviously important to cast an actor of color in the role, and they chose the television veteran Harry Rhodes, probably best known for his role in Roots. The primary villain, Governor Breck, is played by veteran actor and one-time Academy Award nominee Don Murray, best known for movies like Bus Stop, Shake Hands with the Devil, and Advise and Consent. If we lose this battle, that's the end of the world as we know it! This will be the end of human civilization, and the world will belong to a planet of apes! While the comedian Severn Darden plays a secondary villain as the Mengele-inspired Culp. As for the female lead, the chimpanzee Lisa, Arthur Jacobs' own wife, Natalie Trundy, returned for her third role in a Planet of the Apes film, following her roles as a mutant in Beneath the Planet of the Apes, and the animal psychologist Stephanie Branton in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Filming began in late January of 1972, with most of the exterior locations being filmed at Century City on what used to be part of the Fox backlot, and at the University of California, Irvine where newly constructed modernist buildings lended a near-futuristic look. Despite the low budget, director J. Lee Thompson was able to take advantage of dark settings and dynamic camera angles to hide many of the constraints, and he relied on old-school filmmaking techniques to make small crowds seem much larger than they were. My God, there's more! In a further effort to save on costs, Many props, sets, and costumes were borrowed from several of Fox's television properties, including Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and The Time Tunnel, and most of the background apes were given pull-over masks instead of getting the full John Chambers treatment the series was famous for. The real difficulties came after a first cut was assembled, which test audiences decried as too bloody, too violent, and much too harrowing for children. The studio, worried about an R rating, demanded cuts to several of the more brutal scenes and a drastic change to the ending. In the original ending, which you can find on the film's Blu-ray release, after Caesar gives his climactic speech denouncing humanity, the gathered mob beats Governor Breck, presumably to death, and the film cuts to black. While all three of the previous films were notorious for shocking and downbeat endings, this ending was simply too upsetting for the studio and test audiences, forcing the filmmakers to dub in new dialogue from Roddy McDowell, in which he tells the crowd to lay down their weapons. But now... Now we will put away our hatred. The filmmakers then did some hasty editing to incorporate this into the film, removing Breck's death. With a new cut assembled, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes ultimately received a PG rating, making it the only entry in the original series to not earn a G and it released in June of 1972, less than six months after cameras began rolling. It received mixed reviews from critics, with the only consistent praise going to McDowell's performance and Thompson's directing, even while the critics called the story out for its heavy-handed themes and general joylessness. It did well at the box office, though, raking in about two and a half times its budget in the first week of release. It was especially popular with black audiences, and in its theatrical run, the film made a total domestic gross of just over $9 million, certifying the film as a hit and ensuring a fifth entry for the franchise. It's usually hard to divorce any individual sequel from a series when discussing its legacy, but Conquest of the Planet of the Apes is a minor exception, as it was the inspiration for the wildly successful franchise reboot, 2011's Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Take your stinking bar off me, you damn dirty ape! Personally speaking, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes has always been my favorite sequel to the original Planet of the Apes, particularly for its provocative nature and use of science fiction to explore current, real-world problems that could never be addressed more directly. 
It was bold to make a movie in 1972 that digs deep into issues of slavery, racial resentment, violence, and oppression that mirrors something as incendiary as the Watts Riots, but the thin camouflage of science fiction was just enough to allow the filmmakers to get away with it. While it presents itself as a sci-fi action-adventure, and while the studio behind it wanted to market it as a decent family film, Conquest is true to the legacy of the series, in that it isn't interested in making audiences comfortable. Instead, it wants you to really think about the state of the world around you, and what it could mean for the future, and it has a unique way of recontextualizing a neat cultural narrative into something more nuanced. How do you propose to gain this freedom? By the only means left to us. Revolution. Perhaps this is why I dislike the shoehorned theatrical ending so much, because it pulls the story's biggest punch. By this point, Caesar has gone all the way over the edge to a point where there is no coming back, and that's by design. Dane was trying to show the horror of the cycle of violence, that once forged, it becomes impossible to break. But this sanitized ending, where Caesar is allowed to keep some semblance of heroism after what he has done, ignores human nature. The cuts are problematic too, because while the studio was only concerned with the rating, the story's whole point is violence. To cut away from the bloody and gruesome business of revolution is to make Caesar's actions more acceptable, and while we're supposed to sympathize with the horrors he and his fellow apes have been subjected to, we're also supposed to see that responding to violence with violence can be just as savage as the sin of slavery, no matter the righteousness of the cause. The theme of violence is a constant for the entire series, and Conquest fully embraces the lesson of the original film. Does man, that marvel of the universe, that glorious paradox who sent me to the stars, still make war against his brother? While that film had been more concerned with the consequences of violence on a nuclear scale, this movie shows how social unrest can be no less self-destructive than the atomic bomb. Sure, the themes are about as subtle as an atomic bomb, and the all-black human costumes and Gestapo uniforms are a bit too on the nose, but for the time, it was probably cathartic to see such a nightmarish caricature of current events play out from the comfort of a theater seat. And hey, it's still relevant today. Therefore, there's no doubt in my mind that Conquest of the Planet of the Apes is deserving of the title of sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What's your favorite Planet of the Apes movie, not counting the first one? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. You can also support me on Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more, or you can check out my website at emagill.com to find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. On top of that, I've got a podcast about Apple TV's foundation, called Cracking Foundation, that you can find wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, though, when we'll aim for the moon and miss, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody. Frank. Funny, now that I know they won't kill me, I don't enjoy them. <laughs>